So, Roger, Dr. Roger Hoopengardner, your keynote. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, welcome to uh, Michigan State University, to the 100th anniversary of ANR Week, and uh, of course, uh, to uh, welcome to almost spring. Uh, today is supposed to be 55 degrees here in East Lansing, and that's uh, <clears throat> good for us. That's a flight day for bees, especially this time of year. Um, when they asked me to do this, I uh, agreed, uh, I guess partly, partly because I've been around probably longer than most. Uh, I can uh, remember the first ANR week meeting I was at <clears throat> in this building um, was uh, 63 years ago. Uh, so um, it's uh, been a long climb. Actually, when I, that first meeting, I suspect we might have had 75 or 100 people. So this is really quite a change. The 150th anniversary, <coughs> actually, as, you, as uh, you noticed on the slides, this is the oldest uh, beekeeping organization in the country. Uh, we beat out states like uh, New York and Vermont by a couple of years. <coughs> it's really uh, uh, quite an achievement. And as you'll see when I go through this story, um, Michigan Beekeepers and the Michigan Beekeepers Association have been at the forefront nationally, uh, certainly early in, the, uh, in this story, um, they were very, very active. Well, <clears throat> the past is prologue. You really got to start, where does, where does the Michigan beekeepers 150 years ago, where were they in, in their life? It really starts with uh, the Reverend L. L. Langstroth, who invented the movable comb hive in 1851, uh, which was patented in 1852. <clears throat> this was actually one of the most monumental changes in beekeeping for the last 20,000 or 30,000 years. Because up until that time, they kept bees maybe in boxes or, or robbed honey from trees, but they really didn't keep bees until th this uh, invention. It, it was really quite an invention. That r recognition of the bee space and the fact that you could uh, hang these combs in this hive where they could be suspended and the beekeeper could really examine and, and, and control the hive. Up until that time, he was just a bee haver, and every, uh, once a year, he killed the bees and took the honey and wax out. The uh, unfortunate part of, <coughs> of that story was that Langstroth made almost no money on his invention. Um, everybody could look at the box and decide, well, I can make that, and they did. Uh, and, and they didn't, uh, pay any royalties to him. Um, I guess you'd have to say he survived um, historically because the invention was so great. He published two, <coughs> three, actually three editions of his Hive and the Honeybee. The third edition uh, I became enamored of and in fact uh, did an annotated revision of it. Um, still available if you look in the B, B books in the, in the vendor's room. He was, <clears throat> a couple of things in this book, uh, a couple of chapters in this book were really quite important. One of them we'll, we'll touch on is he had a whole chapter on the Italian honeybee, uh, its virtues, its uh, color, everything about the honeybee, or the Italian honeybee, he was enamored of. <clears throat> um, never saw the bee. It was all from the literature, and um, as you'll see, they in, uh, brought them over to the country. Langstroth and Simon Wagner and others <coughs> uh, imported the Italian honeybee in 1859 and 1860, and this is, uh, among others, the first importations of the uh, African bee, I mean, African bee, the uh, <coughs> Italian bee. Um, It took over almost instantly. Everybody recognized it. Um, <clears throat> the German black bee uh, that was here, the one that we brought over from Europe, uh, was a, all right, except that they were just a little touchy. Um, in fact, it's uh, sometimes downright touchy. Um, I can remember as a youth, there was a few of those colonies still around, 
and you didn't have any problem recognizing them when you got up to them. Uh, they work you over pretty well. <coughs> um, not bad honey producers, but they just uh, were just unfriendly. Um, and so um, it, it took over uh, almost instantly. All right. Let's, um, oh, I wanted to show you the, the diagram of the um, Langstroth hive from his book. Um, certainly one we wouldn't copy today. Um, and maybe it was a good thing that uh, the patent on this hive was uh, kind of ignored. It was the B space that, of course, was not ignored. And everybody recognized that part instantly. 1860 to 1879, the first 20 years, I'll say this uh, uh, kind of story, most of the <clears throat> things you'd read in the, in the journals was the, uh, the moving of bees from box hives to movable comb hives. Uh, they, they had bees, uh, they maybe had, uh, I think there was one story, one beekeeper had 500 colonies in box hives. And, um, but the change from these box hives to the movable comb hives. And one of the things that I learned a long time ago uh, from an old southern beekeeper <coughs> was drumming. <coughs> and what is drumming? Well, what they did is they would put the movable comb hive on top of their box hive, open the cover of the box hive, and then What happened? All the bees would run up into the, the, the movable comb hive. Very, very simple, very uh, effective, and uh, if you want to get bees from one box to another, that's just the way you do it. And, uh, there were lots of experiments on comb size. I mean, if you look at the literature, it was just, uh, every beekeeper had his own idea, I want one. 16 inches long, I want one 14 inches long and 11 inches high, and, and they just had all kinds of sizes. And, and Langstroth wasn't the first one, to, or I shouldn't say the first one. There were just lots of patent hives out there. I, I don't know the exact number, but there were a lot of them. And there was, of course, at this point, support from Michigan Agricultural College and A.J. Cook, Albert John Cook was a, um, professor here, he, was, he graduated from Michigan's Agricultural College in 1865 and then became a faculty member in 1867. And uh, he was probably one of the uh, drivers of the Michigan Beekeepers Association in those early years. Lots of uh, articles on queen rearing and in introducing uh, Italian stock to their hives. Uh, <clears throat> everybody realized very quickly that these, this was the bee that they wanted. Um, the, the European or uh, German black bee just was not what they wanted. Um, I put J.T. Davis from Delhi Township because that's where I live, just five miles south of here. And, um, um, but James Hedden and Dowaziak, and he'll, he'll come up again, um, were big uh, producers of queens, and uh, they were selling them to uh, everybody that, that, that wanted them. And this one fascinated me. Uh, J.T. Davis, again in Delhi, had an article on the number of times a queen bee mates. Now, why was this significant? Well, this was uh, in, in the uh, 1860s, and he, Oh, the, the, some of these queens made it more than once in one day. Well, this was just uh, contrary to all writings and publishing and stories. Um, the, the people like the Reverend Langstroth just couldn't believe that their queens would be promiscuous. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and it wasn't probably until 70 or 80 years later that scientists, oh, yeah, a queen mates more than once. So here's a guy that was certainly way, way ahead of his time and uh, figuring out the biology of, of bees. Here we go, right here. This is the mating sign of uh, 
left by a mated drone, this is part of his uh, reproductive organs. Actually, she queen goes out and um, mates with a drone. It's left, then the next drone comes by and flicks that off, mates with a queen, dies. The next one comes in, flicks his uh, remains of his ediagus off, and, and so on, and, until she finally runs out of uh, probably uh, blood sugar and flies back to the hive. And this is then the, the mating sign. Well, beekeepers recognized this uh, very early. Um, they were pretty good observers at the front of their hive. And then um, when, say, the Merch Virgin came back, they would have this uh, uh, mating sign. And they just assumed that she went out and mated and once and came back, and that was it. And that's how that story kind of got started, probably from the ancients, um, Aristotle or, and so on. They, they were pretty good observers as well. There are two queens. There's an Italian queen right here. And of course, this is a dark queen. And this is the kind of change that was going on at that time. They were replacing one queen with the other, not on the same comb, of course. Um, but uh, <clears throat> this, this happened in, in my apiary uh, some years ago. Uh, and, and the very interesting thing is they're both marked. Um, <clears throat> it happens, I mean, um, you see a queen in a colony and you say, Oh, she got superseded, so you mark her, and then uh, you don't realize that there's another queen running around in there as well. And, um, it's one of those strange phenomenons. Beekeepers, when they find a queen, never go look for another one. <coughs> this is Albert John Cook, or A.J. Cook. was quite a, a dynamic uh, person. He wrote a book called The Manual of the Apiary, and it became probably the most popular bee book at the time. It went through some 20 editions while he was here at Michigan State. Um, and uh, he was just one of the leaders in, in uh, apicultural science and, and beekeeping in, in that era. He came to Michigan State, as I said, in 1867 and left here in 1893. So 25 years he was, uh, Michigan State was probably one of the centers of uh, apiculture and beekeeping in the country. This is A.J. Cook in his apiary, the first apiary. This apiary is probably located, as I can best guess it, where Mary Mayo Residence Hall is on campus. Um, and you, you notice his bee suit. Uh, it was a suit. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> this is typical of the pictures you found in those days. Uh, they just didn't come out there in their coveralls. Uh, they, uh, they had a bee suit. I'm not sure but I, if this is a distortion of the, the photograph or not, but those are certainly not the Langstroth dimensions that we have today. They're a little longer, I think. And, and, um, but um, this is, the, I say, the, the first apiary at Michigan State. One of the things that hit me when I saw this, and this is uh, C.B. Riley, head of uh, entomology at uh, USDA, visited James Head at Dowagiac. Um, C.V. Riley was the first really entomologist in charge of uh, research in uh, at USDA. A very, very notable uh, researcher and uh, administrator in, in this country. And to have him come to uh, Michigan to, to visit a beekeeper really was a big event. And uh, uh, kind of points out kind of the leadership that Michigan had at that time. Again, along this line, the North American Beekeeping Society meets in Cleveland. And uh, Elijah Rood from Wayne, probably Detroit, uh, was elected vice president, and A.J. Cook was elected secretary of this national organization in 1872. J.H. Townley of Tompkins sold Italian queens in 1868 and mailed them to J.T. Rose of Petersburg, Michigan. It took four days to go that distance, but the queen was okay. Um, he, they weren't the first per people to mail queens, but you can see that this was a growing industry, and uh, these queen mailing cages <coughs> were uh, not probably like this modern one, but very similar. Uh, we attribute this to Frank Benton, 
Um, he was a, a USDA researcher uh, at this time, and in fact, as he went to Europe and, uh, a little later than this and, and mailed Queens back to the United States, and that's where we get this Benton mailing cage. If you read Langstroth's book, the third edition, it was probably invented by Langstroth because he describes this box, or wooden box cage with a screen on it that he mailed Queens with uh, way back in the 1850s. Okay, let's now go jump to the 1880s and 18, to 1900s. Movable comb size was still a common theme. If you go through these journals, uh, it was just a, well, I like, my, my hive is designed with, like I say, 14 inch combs and they're better than the 16s and, and so on. It was just a, a common theme. I put this in, uh, there were lots of MBA conferences, most notably Lansing, Jackson, and uh, Kalamazoo, but there were other cities including Detroit. And this is a period, probably the rise of the large scale uh, commercial beekeeper. James Hedden, for example, had 600 colonies in 1869. This is really kind of an interesting aspect. We, we don't think of anything today of, uh, of driving, you know, 20 or 30 miles to an apiary. But in those days, that had to be all done with horse and wagon. And if you can imagine putting uh, five or 10 colonies on a, a wagon and driving a few miles to an apiary, that, that was a, a, a real event. And to have 600 colonies spread out where you could do this is really a, a, an interesting aspect. There's actually a really interesting book if you want to get into that whole story. It's uh, Doolittle's book called uh, A Year in the Apiary. And Doolittle, for those of you who have been around beekeeping know, this is the man who invented the grafting method of queen rearing. And um, uh, he has a book on that as well. But uh, um, the year in the apiary goes on about, you know, putting bees on the back of the wagon and going to this apiary or that apiary. It's a, an interesting story, an interesting book. Put this one in because I happen to see this. This is the December 1889. It was the 24th MBA conference held in the Capitol building in Lansing. And this is the, one of the few really concrete references to the age of Michigan beekeepers. There's a few stories about uh, 1815, 1865 and 1867, but they were a little sketchy in, in whether the organization was really established. But this one clearly says this is the 24th meeting, which puts it back to 1865. Bingham, uh, who was uh, located in Farwell when he did this, patented a bee smoker in, in 1880, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, he moved from Farwell to uh, a town in uh, Allegan County a little later. Um, he didn't invent the smoker. Uh, that was Moses Quimby in New York, but it was, you'll see in a second, uh, this design was really very important. And James Hedden patented his hive, I mean, another patented hive in 1885, and I'll show you that. The Bingham Bee Smoker um, is really the smoker that we use today. Um, what was different about it? Um, again, if I can get... Um, the, uh, can you see my... Uh, okay. Uh, the, the air blast comes down here and underneath the pot and then blasts up. The um, Quimby smoker, the, the air blast was up near the top, just took the smoke out. And, it, and the problem with it, it didn't keep the, the coals or the uh, whatever you're burning going well. And so consequently, um, it, it was just not effective. But the Bingham smoker brought the fire or the air underneath the, the pot and kept the things going. Uh, it's really, uh, I say, the design of the smoker today. Um, you can see up here in the corner, Woodman's, uh, I'll say something about that in a minute, but A.G. Woodman Company bought Bingham's patent almost right away and, um, and became the major producer of these smokers for the next 70 or 80 years. 
Um, they had a few features that we don't have today. Uh, this slot for holding your hive tool and the hook that uh, goes on the front. Some smokers have it, but most of them have dropped that. And I'm not sure why, because they're all useful little uh, devices. I'm sorry. Um, this is the Hedden Hive. Uh, he was enamored of this, this uh, fact that, and if you, again, if you uh, uh, look, he had these uh, wooden thumb screws that were turned, and you could push all the frames together real tight, and he th thought this was important. It was probably nice and, and worked very well for his comb honey supers up above, but uh, as far as the brood frames down below, it wasn't particularly uh, useful. But these were sold quite a bit in Michigan, and I, I was in a barn, uh, oh, 30 or 40 years ago, of the beekeeper, and I bet he had uh, 200 of these boxes still sitting there. He, he wasn't using them, but they, he figured someday he would uh, probably burn them up in his fireplace, but uh, this was the head and hive. James Hedden was an interesting fellow. He was, I say, a, a, a real mover of Michigan bees and beekeeping. Um, if you're as old as I am and are fishermen, uh, you recognize the name. About 1906, seven, something like that, he virtually got out of uh, beekeeping. Why? Because he started making fishing lures and uh, fishing reels. And if you remember uh, head and reels, uh, if some of you are old as I am, you, they were made and, and produced here in Michigan. Um, and virtually got out of the beekeeping business. And it was head and, high, uh, head and reels and, and lures were sold until, I'm gonna guess the 50s. And then somebody bought them out, some other company bought them out. Uh, that's the location of Dowagiac in case you have any those of you who are not familiar with the uh, geography of Michigan. Okay, we now skip to 1900 to 1940s. Interesting, in about 1900, adulterated honey was a big, big item in, in the country. What were they adulterating with? Mostly water. They would put, uh, add water to their honey to get a little more. <laughs> And, um, um, and the beekeepers really were uh, upset by this and um, petitioned the federal government. You know, they were not the only organization, but they were one of the major organizations that got the Food and Drug Administration established in 18, 1906, simply because of the adulteration of, of honey. Uh, some things never change. <laughs> we don't use water anymore. We're more sophisticated than that. We use. Uh, high fructose corn syrup. Well, this gave rise of comb honey, and I, I'm using a modern box, <coughs> the hog half comb, but what was the advantage of comb honey? Well, you couldn't adulterate it, and people recognized that, that this was, this was pure honey, it was in a comb. And so, they, uh, this was really the rise of comb honey in this country, it just became a dominant force until about 1940. At this time, from about 1900 to 1940, Michigan rose to the number one honey producer in the nation. We were, uh, there were stories in the, uh, in the journals of, of come to the, the swamps of Michigan and, and be a honey producer. Uh, they were very big. And primarily, primarily one of the reasons for this uh, was uh, the sweet clover pastures, particularly in a dairy area, uh, we call the milk shed of thumb of Michigan. And there were 250 pound averages were pretty common. Well, why is that? Um, oh, and, and as a consequence of this, <coughs> you, you see pictures in the journals, and this man is holding his hand on top of his beehive, maybe way up here, and uh, it would produce three or 400 pounds. And uh, these got in the journal, and. All the other beekeepers in the country were just envious of Michigan. Well, obviously, if you're producing that kind of honey, you've got the best queens in the world. And so Michigan became uh, really one of the top honey producers in the nation of queen bees, I'm sorry. And they just produced queens and sold queens all over the country simply because they had these best 
colonies, well, they obviously were not necessarily the queen, it was just the, the resources that they were getting. Um, this is the, you know, the milk shed of Detroit was really the thumb area, and the, the product was white sweet clover. Well, why is this so good then and not now? Well, these were pastures, and the cows would go out there and nibble them off. Well, they'd re-sprout and re-sprout and, and uh, get nibbled off, and, and the sweet clover bloomed from June until frost. Now it comes and blooms and dies, and because we don't have cattle nibbling it off. Uh, and it was just an absolute tremendous resource. It's a good honey plant, uh, um, but uh, the fact that it was just being uh, caused to re-sprout and re-sprout and re, uh, each time they nibbled it off, another uh, branch would come out. There's also <coughs> wild raspberry and fireweed in, in, in the logging areas in the northern part of the lower, lower peninsula particularly. When they cut the, the trees and clear cut, mostly. Um, wild raspberry came in very well and uh, along with fireweed. Michigan was noted as the wild raspberry honey capital of the world, if you wish, um, advertised uh, as wild raspberry honey. Um, I saw ads in the journals for uh, extolling the virtues of the raspberry honey. Um, Though fireweed is, is certainly a, a good uh, product as well. Alfalfa hay fields were only cut twice and that was part of the, the yields. And as they say, Michigan became really a top producer of queen bees. I put A.G. Woodman in here in this period. Um, Woodman's bee supplies in Grand Rapids were uh, probably a major force in Michigan beekeepers and Michigan Beekeepers Association. Certainly Baxter Woodman in his later years was just a, a, a stalwart of uh, support for this organization. Um, Woodman's is, uh, was a uh, primarily a producer of uh, metal products, uh, smokers, extractors, merry-go-rounds, uh, hive melters. Uh, when they went out of business in the early 70s, uh, they were bought out by Dayton's and uh, Dayton became the producer of those metal products simply because they just took the business over. That's uh, the wild raspberry. And uh, they were so common in these cut over forests that they would just produce tremendous amounts of honey. Uh, raspberry is one of the best nectar producers that I know. Um, it produces nectar throughout the day so if, you're, if you've got your own raspberry patch, you notice that their bees are on them from morning till night. Uh, they don't, they don't never, the, the nectar is never exhausted, and it is one of the highest sugar concentrations of nectar that I know of. It's around 50%. And this is fireweed. Uh, it grows up in, and it gets its name from the fact that once fire went through and burned the forest, these would, this plant would come up in the bloom. Uh, if you ever go to Alaska, you'll see lots of it. Uh, it's, it's here, uh, just now not very common because the forests have grown back up and we don't have that clear cut very often that uh, allows these plants to flourish in, in great numbers. You'll see them one here and one there, but not the big patches that produces the great yields that we had in the early uh, 1900s. This is the area that was primarily the, that area that produced uh, uh, honey, or, uh, what, raspberry honey. Michigan continued its role in, its a national, uh, in the National Bee Organizations. This was mostly uh, W.Z. Hutchison from Genesee County, Flynn area, Floyd Markham from Lenawee County. Markham, uh, if you get back into the old li literature and, and uh, pamphlets, he had uh, systems of swarm control that were well known, and E.D. Townsend of uh, Gratiot County. And at this time, Russell Kelty was at Michigan State College now. This I took from a, the masthead of the a Beekeeper's Review in 1926, and uh, this had, had been established by Hutchison in 1888, um, a journal. Uh, and it was the official organization of the, of the National Beekeepers Association. 
uh, uh, now a defunct organization. And Ed Townsend, or E.D. Townsend of uh, uh, North Star was the managing editor. This is a picture of Russ Kelty that I have. Russ was a, a agriculturist extension person here at Michigan State from 1920 to 1950. Um, became a commercial beekeeper at that time, uh, full-time, and uh, uh, well-loved by most of the beekeepers in the state. Um, big husky guy, uh, but he, the best story I ever, he had, after he had retired, he was from here. He was, to say, a commercial beekeeper. At age 72, he could put his hand on a flatbed of a truck and be up there. And um, I can't climb up there. <laughs> what happened in 1941, of course, at the beginning of the World War II, and um, Primarily, for lots of reasons, uh, farmers went off to war. Um, they needed uh, other things, and uh, uh, but alfalfa replaced sweet clover as, uh, in the hay uh, pastures of, of the um, the thumb and, and rubber owls. Um, so that that resource kind of disappeared. Uh, cash crops primarily replaced the dairy in, in the thumb, and that was another um, blow to those people who were commercial beekeepers in that area. And this began the period when we got the rise of pollination services. <clears throat> when I was a young beekeeper, uh, beekeepers recognized that pollination was important, but it was just an, a byproduct of the fact that the bees were there gathering honey. But there's two reasons, um, but primarily, and as I'll say that in a minute, uh, the um, bees originally were near orchards, and, uh, but then uh, pesticides became so common after World War II that they drove the apiaries away from the orchards, and this forced the orchardists to now rent bees to bring come back into the, uh, the area. And alfalfa uh, was even, uh, the seed was even produced in the state because it became a dominant uh, forage crop. We don't do any or, or very, 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 very little uh, seed production in the state now. Most of it's in the west, Idaho, Utah, and California. But if you can imagine a field like that producing lots of honey. As I say, most of the orchards had um, apiaries near them. It was just a, a common site. I, I, I took this picture. I'm standing in the orchard, essentially. Um, the bees were just right there, and uh, so the growers didn't have to worry about it. They got their pollination, and, and uh, um, the, the bees were uh, collecting nectar and pollen and, and uh, producing this fruit. But with the advent of, of DDT, particularly in, in the 1946, um, it just uh, killed so many bees that the beekeepers or moved their apiaries away from the apiaries or the, the orchard sites. Most of the fruit is grown along the western co counties of Michigan, uh, what we call the lake effect counties uh, along the western edge. Apple blossom, this is the king bloom. Um, and this is the one that the grower wants to get pollinated, the first bloom out of the five cluster. This is actually a delicious apple. Cherry, tart cherry. Tart cherries are mostly grown up in the, in the uh, um, thumb, or little finger area, I'm sorry, of, uh, of Michigan. But there, there are others, but this is the primary region. Blueberries, those are grown mostly in the southern part of that western fruit belt and a little pocket over here uh, north of us. And cucumbers <coughs> become a major product in this state. Actually, uh, I don't know how we stand today, but at one time we were the number one producer of picnic and cucumbers in this country. Cucumbers are an interesting uh, crop because, uh, or a flower, because they only bloom one day and so the bee has to get there uh, many, many times during the day to uh, 
produce enough seeds in that cucumber to make a good cucumber. This is also a period of the spread of spotted knapweed, and I'll show that to you in a minute. <clears throat> when I was a young beekeeper, along about 1950 or 1951, and I'm not sure if which year it was, but it was one of the two, I visited a, a commercial beekeeper in Oakland County, and he had his apiary in an abandoned uh, gravel pit. And I, uh, we looked at his bees, and I said, well, what's that flower? And he said he called it star thistle. And I said, oh, that's interesting. I've never seen that. <clears throat> well, it has become, or had become, uh, the dominant honey-producing plant in Michigan. It spread uh, everywhere, mostly on disturbed, poor soils. You see it, see it on road cuts and those places where uh, the soil is really dis badly disturbed and, and poor. Uh, if you get it into uh, high uh, quality soils, uh, they just can't compete with quackgrass and other things that grow up. Michigan uh, was a closed state. <coughs> and when the, the American fowlbird became a real uh, problem in the late teens and early 20s, most states uh, developed a, an apiary inspection service where they went in and if they found uh, American fall brood disease in your colony, they would uh, kill the bees and, and burn the equipment to prevent the spread of the disease. <coughs> uh, well, Michigan not only went beyond that, you could move your colonies out of the state on combs, but you could not move them back. So this meant you, were, uh, you couldn't be a migratory beekeeper and go to the south. Commercial beekeeping became concentrated primarily in the, in the upper northwest part of the Lower Peninsula. Why? Well, they were near those uh, orchards, and so they could move their bees there in an evening uh, or at night and uh, get back home. Uh, so they were just, it was just easier, especially because they were non-migratory, they didn't have the equipment they could plop bees on trucks and move them easily. And as I say, apiaries moved away from the orchards and, uh, because of insecticide poisoning. At this time, uh, our uh, Michigan State had uh, E.C. Burt Martin as the apiculturist um, when it was Michigan State College and then Michigan State University. This is one of the few pictures I have of uh, Burt in, in action. I have lots of pictures of him um, older and retired, but uh, this is when he was in, in his glory in the apiary teaching students how to keep bees. Uh, this is spotted knapweed. If you haven't seen it, it grows along roads everywhere. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this is a non-native invasive species. And the U.S. government, uh, about 20 years ago, decided that they wanted, wanted to do something about non-native invasive bee, or species of plants and passed a law that they had to be removed, if possible. And so the federal government has now a campaign out where they have, are releasing I think three different species of insects to feed on this plant and to get rid of it. I'm, sure they're, I'm not sure they'll ever get rid of it, but they may reduce its stand substantially. And that's unfortunate for Michigan beekeepers. This is the primary region of commercial beekeeping in Michigan. Don't want to slight the Upper Peninsula. They became the uh, leader in bird's foot trefoil seed production. Um, both the eastern and western parts of the Upper, upper Peninsula are the primary areas. Um, the reason for that is that the, the high humidity in the summer uh, allows them to harvest the seed effectively. Uh, if, it, if it becomes too dry, the, the, when the combine hits the seed, they, sp they, they, they sp spray and, and, and get missed, they get not picked up. So they like the high humidity. It keeps them from popping and snapping and blowing the seeds everywhere. That's birch for trefoil. It gets its name because the seeds are, are a little three-prong, uh, and it looks like a bird's foot. So that's why it's bird's foot trefoil. OK, Michigan beekeeping from 1983 to the present. Michigan becomes an open state. Um, Finally, uh, after many, many years of being closed, and we were the, one of the last states that had the border closed, we became an open state. That is, you could move combs back and forth across the border 
most of the time they had to be inspected either in and out or both. And, um, uh, and so commercial beekeeping became uh, fully migratory. And what that meant is that uh, they would mostly put their bees on pallets, uh, Florida colony to a pallet, and um, with a front end loader, put them on trucks and, and could move them all over, both to, for pollination and for, of course, for wintering. And so wintering in southern states became f more common for commercial beekeepers. They could uh, increase their colonies in the south, uh, add queens, uh, build them up for the sp spring, and move them back at that time. Tracheomites came into the state in 1985, and that certainly impacted us drastically, dramatically. Uh, varroa mites in 87, and winter migration became almost essential for well, these early, an early tracheomite period for commercial beekeepers, and so they were, uh, if they weren't migratory before, they became migratory at that time. Number of colonies of bees drops in half over this period, or actually longer this period. I'm going to show you to here. This is the number of colonies of bees from 1940-something to, to, to 2009. Uh, at 1946, its peak here was almost six million colonies, and today we're just a little over two. I want to point out one real drop, and you can see it there. Um, this drop right here, almost a million colonies in one year, that's the year of the, the tracheomites came into the country. And um, it just took out a lot of beekeepers and a lot of colonies, and they dropped. Uh, the number of, of colonies is probably still declining, um, maybe not as fast. Uh, the number of beekeepers actually has increased. This room is a good example. Um, but the number of colonies has declined. Uh, commercial beekeeping has become more difficult and, um, and they just have dropped out. And uh, a typical commercial beekeeper in Michigan today has four or five thousand colonies. And so you drop one of those out and uh, uh, you can see it takes a lot of beekeepers to make up for that. Almond pollen pollination prices escalate greatly. When I first started keeping bees, um, almonds were almost a non-entity. When I first got into the uh, job at, at Michigan State, I think there were 50,000 acres of almonds. There's now over 800,000 acres of almonds. It takes two colonies of, of bees to pollinate an uh, acre of almonds. And if you've got 800,000 acres, you can do the math. That's a million six colonies needed to pollinate almonds. And there's only about 2.2 .2 million colonies in the entire United States. And so you can see <coughs> uh, that uh, during almond pollination, which ended probably a week or two ago, more than half, probably almost 70% of the colonies in the United States are in California pollinating almonds. As a consequence, come beekeepers no longer migrate always to the south. A lot of them migrate to California. And it's November, early, late October, they um, put their bees on a truck and move them to California and use that as their wintering haven where they build up their colonies for the almond pollination and then bring them back to, to Michigan. The almond acreage and pollination fees increased during this period uh, almost exponentially. One year the, the pollination price would be $75, the next year it'd be 100, the next year it'd be 100 and a quarter, and, and I think it's in excess of $150 a colony today. And almond pollination has become the dominant force in uh, commercial beekeeping in the United States. I mean, if you wanted to define commercial beekeeping, uh, it's certainly in uh, terms of uh, where they're getting their, most of their money and what's driving the industry. It's certainly almond pollination. <clears throat> this is an almond orchard I took in 1985. This particular farm had 15,000 acres on one farm. I was kind of 
impressed. And I came back and asked the horticulturist involved with blueberries in Michigan, and I said, how many blueberry, acres of blueberries are there in Michigan? And he says, about 15,000. And we were the number one producer of blueberries at the time. Actually, we have more than that today, but uh, you can see the <coughs> relationship. Um, we have maybe 50 or 60,000 acres of, of fruit in this state alone. I mean, that's all, all counting all our fruit. And um, here they have uh, 15,000 uh, acres on, on one farm. The rows come together at the horizon. If you ever want to treat, actually go out there late February and, and uh, visit some of these uh, orchards or farms. Well, <clears throat> this brings us up to the present. And of course, CCD, colony collapse disorder. Uh, is this the result of moving bees to almonds? Or is it all the imported diseases and parasites? Probably a good question. We picked up chalk brood about 1970. This is a, a fungal disease spread through the air, actually. Tracheal mites, 1985. Varroa mites in 1987. This is not clear, Nosema serrani. Uh, this is the uh, protozoan parasite of the, of the intestinal tract. We didn't recognize it until much later than this, but if they went back and looked at some earlier samples, it, it, it probably showed up earlier than we thought. This was a Nosema found uh, in the uh, Apis serrana of uh, Southeast Asia, and how it uh, arrived here, nobody seems to know for sure, but it, it, it did. And last, maybe, uh, was his small hive beetle in 1996 when it first was recognized. Um, so we have all of these uh, pests that have, weren't here before. And you add pesticides to this and viruses, and maybe this is the, the cause of CCD. At this point, no one knows. And maybe we need to ask the, the current agriculturist, Dr. Wang here, uh, his opinion, I mean, when you see him in the hall, hey, what's, what's causing CCD? <laughs> he, and he'll probably say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, this is a picture, if you haven't seen it, uh, of uh, <clears throat> bees on a flatbed going probably to California or, or, or at least to a pollination. There are lots of colonies on that truck. Um, they're stacked three high. Um, they put a, a, a net over them and, and uh, drive as much as they can, to, uh, say to California, a couple, two or three days, and they're there. Big business. Uh, I want to thank those beekeepers and friends of the Mann Library in Cornell University for contributions that allowed the Mann Library to digitize the American Bee Journal from 1861 to 1900. This is the, my source of many of those stories about beekeepers in, in Michigan. Uh, it was fascinating to go through them. Um, and it's, it, this modern age, it just blows my mind because I could sit there at my desk and, and look at these journals that were in, in Ithaca, New York. Uh, and uh, not only Ithaca, New York, but they're uh, 100 year old. And I hope you enjoy this 150th anniversary of the Michigan Beekeepers celebration.